Hello everyone and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Cloud Standards Customer Council, Cloud Customer Architecture for Blockchain. My name is Tracy Berardi, Program Manager of the CSCC. Thanks for joining us today. So in this presentation we're going to discuss blockchain technology and basic blockchain concepts that define a standard reference architecture that can be used for creating blockchain applications. Uh, this paper, Cloud Customer Architecture for Blockchain, is a new reference architecture uh, that we published this month, just, uh, just recently. So we're very glad to have everyone uh, joining us today. A lot of interest in this, this topic. Um, the Cloud Standards Customer Council, just for a little background, is an end-user advocacy group founded back in 2011 by the Object Management Group, or OMG, an international IT standards organization. And the Cloud Council is dedicated to accelerating cloud successful adoption and drilling down into the standards, security, and interoperability issues surrounding the transition to the cloud. So we work with cloud standards bodies, open source groups, and uh, cloud customers to publish these vendor neutral guides and reference architectures um, on important cloud computing topics and technologies. The papers are then distributed across our network. Uh, we host webinars with the authors, and we help to inject customer requirements into the um, cloud standards development. So this slide, just for reference, uh, contains a list of papers that are published this year, uh, as well as years prior. So under 2017, you'll notice we've published a hybrid integration reference architecture, an API management architecture, security reference architecture, a uh, discussion paper on data residency challenges, which was co-written by um, our security working group and the OMG's data residency working group, um, a new practical guide to cloud management platforms that we just published on our site yesterday. It's a good overview of CMPs and, and their capabilities. Um, and coming soon, we'll announce uh, version 2.0 of our big data and analytics architecture. But today we're here to talk about blockchain. Um, oh, and it looks like we have nearly 200 people logged in at just the right time. So you're welcome to visit our website to read all of this material. It's, it's posted publicly up on our resource hub, and our site is cloud-council.org. And if you're interested in joining our mailing list or contributing to papers, I encourage you to sign up uh, and join a working group. It is a free membership. So today, um, just a, a, a little overview. Um, so we've been working on this series of cloud reference architectures that uh, describe how to implement particular application solutions using cloud infrastructures. So I've provided direct links to these papers um, that will describe how to leverage the cloud for things like e-commerce, uh, mobile applications, IoT, big data, API management, and some of the others that I mentioned a moment ago. The cloud reference architectures that are published by the Cloud Council are straightforward descriptions of elements needed to implement particular solutions using cloud infrastructure, cloud platforms, cloud software, and cloud services. They're deployment neutral, so you're able to use public, private, or hybrid cloud environments. And they're designed to be implementable you know, using infrastructure, platform, or software as a service. So we hope you uh, read these resources, save them, and, and that they're useful in, in your organizations. So I'd like to point you to, uh, in the Bright Talk environment here, there's an Attachments tab. We've gone ahead and, and we've uploaded a PDF copy of today's presentation that you can download and take with you. There's also a link to the blockchain reference architecture in there in its entirety. Um, we'll have some time for, for questions at the end, so you can submit questions through the questions tab. Um, we should have about 10 to 15 minutes. And I'm joined today by my colleague Sabode Monica, an executive IT architect at IBM who helped to write the paper. Sabode is going to take us through blockchain fundamentals um, and the blockchain architecture capabilities. So I'm going to turn it over to you now, Sabode. Thank you so much for joining us today. 
Thanks, Riti. Uh, my name is uh, Subodh Manika, and uh, and I grew to IT architect at IBM Corporation. Um, so let's. What I'm going to do right now is, you know, initially go go ahead and touch base um, a bit on the blockchain to provide a context so that we can get a better idea of the reference architecture. I'm not going to go deep dig deep into uh, blockchain itself, as there are other presentations available for that, and I believe there was one earlier uh, in OMG available. Um, then after providing a high-level overview of blockchain, I'll discuss the reference architecture for block blockchain solutions, and um, then look at some deployment considerations, and a, you know, do, let's do, a, uh, no, we'll walk through a blockchain, um, reference blockchain solution, you know, what I've chosen is a letter of credit application based blockchain. So let's go ahead and proceed. Um, businesses rarely operate in isolation. They generally benefit by connecting with other parties, you know, such as their customers, suppliers, and so on. Um, in many cases, these, they even connect across geog geography, geographic boundaries. Um, you know, typically, like most of the banking system, you know, crosses geographic boundaries. As businesses operate, you know, wealth is generated um, as goods and services, um, and they, these wealth and services, goods, everything move across the business network. Uh, today, this growth of wealth is constrained by friction in the business network. So what are frictions? You know, these are inefficiencies that impact the smooth flow of the operation of the business. Um, over a period of time, you know, many of these frictions have been eliminated. Um, for example, businesses have started adopting, you know, there used to be a time when, you know, if you go apply for, you know, for settlement of a house or something, um, wet signature is important. Um, and you know, a lot of times without a wet, wet, you know, wet signature. By wet signature, I mean like with a physical pen or you know, signing on a piece of paper. Um, but over a period of time, you know, people have started adopting digital signatures instead. In, in fact, in my own personal experience, I did a re uh, my real estate transaction with the owner from whom I bought, and the owner was almost eight thousand miles away, um, and all this thing happened without any loss of time. Um, but, you know, however, there are also situations when elimination of one friction you know, kind of ends up resulting into another. Um, while Internet, you know, reduced a lot of friction, you know, from, uh, like, they, you know, in, in the past, like, 20, 25 years, one of the issues it also has given rise is the cyber crime. Uh, so generally, there are there are, it's, it's 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 a combination of friction, one friction going off, and then another friction coming up. And um, ideally, we want to reduce all the friction. The picture shown here shows how businesses typically operate. You know, this is kind of a before picture or a status quo picture uh, without blockchain in the in, in in the scene. Each participant keeps their own ledger, which is uh, you know, which they which are updated to represent the business transactions as they occur. So for example here we have card of party records, party C, uh, then party A, bank, auditors, and, and party B. Um, having these own ledger is kind of expensive proposition, like due to duplication of effort and not only that, you know, intermediaries uh, adding margin, like anything that needs to happen, you know, we have to go across uh, uh, other 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 parties' ledger, and then so all these things add up um, expenses to the process. Um, it is clearly inefficient, you know, as the business condition, um, the con the contract is duplicated at every network. It's also vulnerable. For example, if the bank record goes down, you say something happens to the bank uh, and it's compromised. Anything that's relying on the bank is going to come to a halt. As you can see, one of the biggest issues that you can see here is everybody maintaining their own ledger. So moving on to the next slide. Um, so 
the in the inefficiency of the individual ledger in the earlier setup um, can be eliminated and in this picture it has been eliminated at the at the core of the blockchain is indeed uh, is the sharing of ledger that is distributed across the business network thus blockchain has the potential to radically alter the way uh, enterprises conduct their business businesses uh, for example a brokerage firm may not need to go to depository trust clearing corporation um, they can reduce operational cost by reducing inefficiency um, i know like uh, that there are uh, blockchain based based money transfer now available that is much cheaper and much quicker um, they can dramatically change business procedures and you know, how they do the business uh, these could result in new opportunities for innovation too um, like all these uh, the, the, the innovation in blockchain can also result in new opportunities. In fact, uh, very, uh, very recently, maybe about a year ago or so, I saw a request from U.S. Uh, Defense Advanced uh, Research Project Agency, the DARPA. Uh, they were looking for ideas of using blockchain to share messages securely. I mean, like nobody would have thought like you can use blockchain for that purpose, but yeah, it, it is possible. Um, moving on to the next slide. So let's look at some of the blockchain fundamentals. Uh, behind, these are the fundamental things that are behind blockchain. Like I mentioned earlier, blockchain is a shared ledger distributed across the business network. Thus, um, if, if there is an insurance business market network, then the participants in this case uh, will be the insurance companies and they all may share the same ledger. When the transaction occurs, these transaction blocks are consensually uh, confirmed by some agreed upon algorithm. You know, there are multiple ways of agreeing on these things. And all confirmed transaction blocks are appended to the ledger. Notice that I mentioned the word. Permanent. Oh, it's Tracy. I've got, you cut out there for a second. Sorry, Sabo, just maybe the last five seconds we... Lost you. Oh, okay, no problem. Um, so let me start on. Oh, we lost you again. Can you hear me? Yes, right now. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, so, so I was basically mentioning that uh, you know, blockchain. One of the fundamental things in the blockchain is the shared ledger. Um, and, you know, in the case of, for example, in the case of an insurance business, every uh, participant in the business, insurance business network may, will maintain a ledger and they all will be maintaining the same ledger. So when the transaction occurs, these transaction blocks, you know, they all have to be consensually approved uh, and then added to, appended to the ledger. Uh, like I mentioned, um, you know, I'm using the word append here. So basically, once the block, one of the block, fundamental things about blockchain is the transactions are permanent in nature. Only append operation is permitted on the ledger. The transaction blocks are linked to the previous transaction block um, using cryptographic hash function. And because of this chaining of the blocks, you know, hence the term blockchain. Given that the transaction can only be appended, uh, all transactions that are added to the uh, to the chain are done so permanently. And moving on to the next slide. Um, so let, let us look at a very high level view of a blockchain network. Blockchain systems, um, you know, system consists of a number of nodes, each with each having its own ledger where the transactions are maintained. Typically, these nodes belong to different organizations. For example, uh, in the case of a bank, some some of the banks, I mean, the, the ba banks like such as uh, Bank of America, HSBC, BNP Paribas, Deutsche Bank, US, you know, UBS, um, Mitsubishi, uh, UFJ, you know, all these things would be maintaining uh, their own ledger at their node. Of course, the transactions in the, the, the contents of the ledger would be the same, but they all maintain um, their own ledger. The nodes communicate with each other. 
um, in order to gain agreement on the contents of the ledger, and they do that, and they do not need a central authority to coordinate and validate the process. Uh, the transactions are um, added to the ledger after gaining agreement uh, between the participating nodes. Uh, each, each one of these banks are considered nodes, each participating node. Um, this process of gaining agreement you know, we call consensus. Uh, once the transaction is added to the ledger, it cannot be altered, like I mentioned earlier, except by adding a new transaction. You can always add a new transaction after you added the existing transaction. Um, cryptographic algorithms provide integrity in this process of adding the transaction, and in addition, it also ensures that only authorized entities perform the operation. Uh, this authority to perform transaction on the blockchain can use one of the two models. You know, generally, there's a permission or permissionless model. In a permissioned blockchain, user enrolls in the blockchain network before they can perform a transaction. For, for, for example, um, a permissioned um, blockchain platform is uh, something like, like uh, Hyperledger Fabric, Ripple, etc. Uh, in a permissionless blockchain, anyone can perform um, anyone can perform uh, the transaction, but typically are restricted from performing operations on, on the data they own. Examples of permissionless, you know, Ethereum, there's counterparty, Bitcoin, you know, which is very popular. Uh, those are some of, the, some of the things. In general, business transactions involve agreement uh, between the parties. Um, thus, you know, to accommodate this, Business-oriented blockchains include the ability to use smart contracts. You know, a lot of times, smart contracts are uh, they, they're called uh, chain code. For example, Hyperledger Fabric calls it chain code. Um, these are executable chain codes are essentially executable software modules that is run on part of uh, and as part of validating the transaction. Though the ledger um, can be seen as identical in every node. Complex blockchain allows differences in, in the nodes and the ledger using a concept called subchains or channels. So channels, um, you know, it, it, it's kind of um, apply, you know, done for uh, privacy, those type of reasons. Uh, essentially, channels are logically separate. Um, they are logically separate chains that occupy the same physical blockchain. Each channel may be owned by a different entity um, and may be accessible um, by a different set of users. Okay. Um, moving on to some key characteristics of uh, blockchain. So let us now look at some key characteristics here. Um, cryptography. Blockchain achieves validity and trust through the use of uh, cryptographic function. Um, they basically, you know, every block is, has a hash and it links to the previous block and the next block uh, links to the current block through these hashes. So anything that changes, the hash changes, and you know, this is what makes a blockchain immutable um, because changing one block or even like one transaction within the block invalidates uh, the hash, and then you know, that's, it, it, the whole link falls apart. The key characteristics of the, um, of the blockchain is the fact that the transactions are immutable, okay? uh, which is also based on, on the cryptographic uh, hash. Uh, given the transactions are immutable, the origin of the transaction can clearly be traced, thus providing another important characteristic uh, called provenance. Now, provenance is essentially uh, looking at the pedigree of the, uh, looking at the history of the current uh, uh, transaction. Uh, you can go all the way back to the origin of the transaction, and then uh, you can find out what path it took. And this becomes kind of, you know, interesting and important in some of the industry. For example, the defense, uh, you know, airline and defense industry, they look for Provenance of 
all the parts that go into the, uh, into the aircraft. Um, today, it is very cumbersome to maintain that. However, you know, with, with blockchain, this whole process becomes pretty um, easy. Next one is this transaction process. Given that we're dealing with a business network, uh, decentralized computing infrastructure and processing become a key characteristic, and so does the database, you know, where each participating node has its own distributed data store. Next one is the shared ledger. Uh, you know, we, we have seen that in the past, you know, we have been discussing about this, um, and you can see how this is a key characteristic still for the blockchain network. Cloud computing, um, given the, the, there's a huge potential for large amount of, you know, a need for large amount of resource. Uh, computing and storage, uh, as well as other system resources, uh, which is why blockchain frequently involves the use of cloud computing platform. Um, the next one is the peer-to-peer -peer network. Yeah, the, the participating nodes communicate through peer-to-peer -peer network without any central or intermediate uh, intermediate node. Uh, sometimes also blockchain system users also use wallets to uh, to store their credentials. So that's another one of them that is uh, uh, you know considered as uh, key characteristics. So moving on to the next slide. Um, this picture, um, you know, we, like we're going to be discussing more details about this picture in the next few charts, but I want to provide and present this uh, slide. This picture essentially uh, shows a typical um, uh, architecture of a uh, blockchain platform. Um, it also shows various capabilities that are typically in the blockchain uh, environment, blockchain platform environment. Uh, as you can see, there are three main domains that are shown, the public network, uh, the cloud network, and the enterprise uh, network. The public network um, is essentially you know, the, the vast internet. Um, so whereas the cloud is where the node, uh, the blockchain node resides, and enterprise is typically the, uh, the enterprise where the enterprise applications and enterprise data reside. The capability required for blockchain may be implemented in any network, actually. And what's shown here is just you know, what we recommend. For example, there's nothing that states um, that some of the components that are shown in the cloud network uh, has, to, you know, has to be in the cloud. It can also move to other, other environments. But this is what, uh, what is recommended. So let's go start dig deeper into these things and look at various uh, um, components that are discussed there. The first one is the um, users uh, component. U users are mostly in the public network. You know, it is, it is always conceivable that some users uh, will be in the uh, cloud network, uh, those to be typically the operational, operational or administrative users. Uh, they can be within the cloud network, but predominantly the users are in the public network. Um, who are users? Well, users are entities. You know, it can be human or non-human. Uh, a non-human entity uh, uh, user could be a case of IoT device. A IoT device participating in a blockchain uh, activity. That could be a, a user entity too. So. Users are entities, you know, they create who create the blockchain application. You know, some of the some of the users could be blockchain app, uh, uh, developers of blockchain application, and people who I mean, users who perform blockchain operations using the blockchain application, and those who manage the application as well as manage the blockchain network. So they could be developers. These are blockchain developers who create blockchain applications for the businesses to suit the business needs. You know, they take the requirements and implement a blockchain application. They develop smart contracts that interact with the blockchain 
and are used by and and these applications that they develop are used by the business and end users. They typically use software development environment to develop their applications, and then uh, they probably have their own uh, test environment and test it. And then by the by the developers. Is that a question? Uh, so I, I was just going to say we we you cut out briefly there for a second, maybe the last minute. Sorry oh, okay. about that. No, no, no problem. So, so there are various type of users. Um, one of them is the developers. Uh, the developers are people, you know, people who develop blockchain applications. That they go talk to the business users, and based on the requirements they get, they could develop business application. And then once they develop the business application, you know they also develop smart code, uh, smart contracts. Um, and then once they develop, they hand it over to administrative users um, who uh, deploy these blockchain applications. Uh, they, these administrative users may also configure uh, new nodes, um, you know, you know blockchain, the, any blockchain related activity they might be they might perform. Um, operators are those who essentially keep the lights on. These are people who monitor the the the, the nodes uh, to make sure uh, that they are operational. You know, they might take a day to day backup. Those those, you know, those those are the type of operators I'm talking about here. Uh, there could be auditors. Auditors are essentially part of the business user community. Reviewing the blockchain transactions. From illegal, um, um, they could also be generic business users. Basically, in applications, these could be your insurance, uh, you know, stock, you know, traders. So all these people, they, you know, they just deal with blockchain applications. They are totally unaware of it. In network, they are basically the application users. So, moving on to the next slide. Um, so, next one is the edge servers. Um, there is, in essentially, you know, like this shouldn't come as a surprise. There is a need to protect the information coming into the uh, into the data and in the data center environment. In this case, the blockchain network environment. Uh, the network service, the, the edge service, handles the tasks. Uh, the tasks. They, you know, they allow the data to flow safely from the outside world um, into the cloud environment and into the enterprise. And the typical components that comprise the, the edge service, you know, your standard things like you know firewalls, load balancers, um, and as well as you know content delivery networks. Okay, moving on to the next slide, um, the blockchain application itself. Um, these are essentially the business applications, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, they present the capabilities to the business users. They essentially hide the of the business users and present a facade of the blockchain as it relates to the business user. And the blockchain applications can take many forms. It doesn't have to be uh, a web-based application. It can take a many form. It can be a web-based application with all the code running, you know, close in, in the cloud, maybe maybe close to the blockchain platform. Um, it can also be something running on the end user's device. You know, in fact, like in the supply chain environment, that becomes uh, the more appropriate way of creating the blockchain application. So moving on to the next slide. These applications um, interface with the blockchain platform through APIs offered by the API, uh, by, by the block blockchain provider. So the applications may also access um, other server-side resources uh, such as, um, you know, databases. You know, the, the application is application. It does everything what 
a typical application does today uh, with one other additional feature of accessing the blockchain to interface with the blockchain platform. Moving on to the next slide. The transformation and uh, uh, connectivity uh, uh, com component. So frequently the business applications or the smart contract or chain code of chain may have a need to access the legacy system um, and the enterprise data in the enterprise network. For example, you may have a supply chain blockchain application that may need to update the enterprise uh, SAP system. For example, say when the, when the good arrives, you know, something that is supposed to be shipped arrives, you know, you may want to update the uh, SAP system because that's your legacy system that does 10 other things. Um, so it may have to, your blockchain application may have to access the, um, the enterprise application. To accommodate this, you know, of course, the enterprise application is secured, right? So to accommodate this, there may be some transformation or connectivity component required. And this is what this particular component does. So this component enables um, secure connection to, to the enterprise system. system. Um, the capability that this component provides may also include enterprise secure connectivity that may enable the application requesting access to the enterprise resource to authenticate and authorize themselves, um, other, and also transformation capabilities. Transformation capabilities is to, you know, basically to transform and you know, enrich or modify or adapt the data in the, uh, that is coming such that the target system understands. Maybe the blockchain application dealing with in you know, a healthcare environment might send an XML message, but the enterprise healthcare system they expect the message in HL7 format. So such conversions can be provided by the transmission component. Um, the data connectivity is essentially, you know, underlying um, co connectivity component you know, that provides VPN type of uh, services. Moving on to the next slide. The enterprise network. Um, enterprise network is comprised um, it's, you know, the companies of the enterprise directory, the enterprise application, and the enterprise data. The enterprise resource should be authenticated and authorized um, to make sure that they have access to the enterprise resource. And this is nothing new. Um, to support this capability, there's likely to be an enterprise directory. The request coming from the service leverage this service to authenticate. Um, these are applications used by the enterprise that uh, interact with the blockchain network. Uh, there are scenarios when a smart contract may need to interact with the enterprise application. A smart, um, a smart contract may need to validate if a bill of lading is available uh, in a letter of credit blockchain application. Uh, it may go uh, check the enterprise system where they probably have a document management system, and it might check there. So such that you know, once it is validated that the bill of uh, lading is available, um, then the flow, the letter of credit flow, can advance. It is also possible that you know, when an enterprise application receives an event, um, the application may trigger a blockchain transaction. For example, you know, maybe like when the letter of, you know, letter of, I mean, not, bill of lading arrived, the enterprise application may trigger uh, a blockchain um, event, say, I mean, blockchain uh, activity, a transaction stating that uh, such an, the, 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 the a bill of lading arrived and at such and such date. Um, lastly, the enterprise data. The enterprise data are the data that support these enterprise applications. It may, may include metadata uh, as well as you know, systems of records uh, for enterprise applications. The enterprise data itself can comprise of transactional data, um, application data, and log, log data. Um, moving on to the next, um, the foundational services. The foundational services are essentially the core services for for the data center. Uh, they they you know they, they 
primarily things dealing with governance, uh, security, monitoring, and so on. Um, for example, there, there, there could be procedures and policies that govern the operation um, of the blockchain network. Uh, you know, there might the, the blockchain platform might have a, a governance policy. So it could, you know this could be that. Um, it could be security. Security again you know, refers to a lot of things. And in this case, um, you know that these are security services like intrusion prevention, intrusion detection, uh, those type of uh, services that are running there that constantly monitor, and then um, those data are then sent to the mon you know all the nodes and the monitoring events are monitored i mean the nodes are monitored for such that they are up and running as well as any um, intelligence that are gathered based on the activities that are going on uh, to have a smooth operation of the of the network um, now moving on to the next one this is the uh, the, the main uh, uh, piece here. Uh, that's the blockchain platform. Uh, the blockchain platform provides the core services of the uh, of the blockchain. It should be recognized that you know there are different there are there are differences between um, uh, blockchain platforms. Uh, you know, like w certain blockchain platforms have certain uh, certain uh, components that may or may not be. In other, uh, in other implementations or in other block, blockchain platforms, um, but they are generally implemented slightly. You know, even though they are generally implemented slightly differently, uh, these components shown here are generally considered core for the blockchain. So let us look at uh, these components. Um, consensus, like I mentioned uh, earlier, this component manages the consensus process of this node uh, within the blockchain network. So various blockchain platforms uh, do have various algorithms for consensus, and some of them, said, you know, in fact, like some of them, such as uh, Hyperledger Fabric, provides a pluggable choice for consensus. Um, you know, these consensus models, these are typically the, you know, uh, there could be like a proof of work, proof of stake, um, you know, you, you would have heard about PBFT, uh, Paxos and and so on. Um, and the next one is a ledger. Uh, ledger is you know basically the, the persistent transaction data in a cryptographically linked uh, transaction block. Um, then the membership service. These services manage ident ident uh, manage um, the identity. Uh, the privacy confidentiality of the network. They also con they control you know which user can have access to which data. Um, next is the event distribution. So over the course of time, you know various activities occur that result in change, such as a new block has been added or the execution of a uh, of a, a smart contract. Events are notifications of significant changes um, or operations that occur in the blockchain network. These events are typically of interest to the participants in the network. Entities interesting, interesting, uh, interested in these events, they typically listen for the events, and if an event is published, you know, they reach to the, uh, they react to the event. So this is earlier I was mentioning that you know when a um, you know when a letter of credit occurs, you know uh, came. I'm sorry, when the bill of lading came, you know the application can trigger an event. Uh, and, and sorry, the application can trigger trigger a transaction, which in turn can trigger an event, and some other entity can react to those events. Communication protocol is the other other component. Uh, this is the protocol by which nodes participating in a block in the blockchain network. Communicate with each other. Um, typically, mem uh, typically members, you know, the, the, the member nodes use peer-to-peer -peer protocol such as um, gRPC. Uh, that way, you know, most of these communicate, all of these communications do not rely on anything in between. They, they are direct. They are usually direct communication. 
Uh, cryptographic services. Uh, we already noted earlier that the transaction blocks are cryptographically linked. Um, this service uh, implements um, cryptographic primitives and services um, that, uh, that are required by these uh, rest of the components. Um, hash function is, uh, is an example of one such uh, primitive. Uh, smart contract or chain code, if available in the, in, in the blockchain platform, determines whether the transaction is valid and can be recorded. Your, bus your business users may trigger payment of an invoice. The, trans uh, the smart contract may check if the, required, uh, if the requirements uh, for the payment are met uh, before trigger triggering a payment. Uh, transactions can invoke a uh, smart contract function which are stateless or stateful um, to perform business logic. In most cases, though not necessarily, smart contract codes are external, you know, access external information um, and systems through the system integration component. The last one is the secure runtime. Um, smart contracts, they run in a secure runtime uh, environment and uh, secure runtime platform, you know, component is one of the uh, standards that, standard components that are available in the um, in the uh, in the blockchain platform. Going on to the next one, um, here are, these are basically some considerations uh, for for, for uh, blockchain cloud deployment. You know, there are two options for permissions. You can have permissionless or permissioned. Uh, most of the businesses use permissioned blockchain platforms. Uh, you know, there are also permissionless, which are, for example, there are, uh, like, there are many permissionless uh, blockchain platforms also available. For example, um, there's like counterparty, Stellar, um, uh, Bitcoin, for example, and, uh, the, and of course there are many permission. Most of the Hyperledger is one of them that's permission, open chain is permission, um, there's this, uh, this uh, block stack. There, there are quite a bit of permissions also. Uh, in my experience, most of the um, businesses use permissioned uh, blockchain platforms. Uh, storage options. You know, there are storage options for you know you have storage options for the ledger, how you store. Uh, there are ledger storage as well as for data storage. Um, data storage supports data other than the blockchain ledger itself. A lot of times it is, you know, in, in practical, practically speaking, a lot of, uh, lot of transactions do involve uh, data that need not be or should not be stored in the ledger itself. Uh, these could be, for, in the earlier example that I was mentioning, there could be a physical uh, PDF copy of a signed uh, bill of lady uh, that you unlikely you want to put it on uh, on the ledger. So those type of things are to be stored in the data data storage. Um, then there is the uh, cloud deployment uh, considerations. Um, typically, you would want to see you know like uh, the things that you want to worry about are. Um, Scalability, um, data bandwidth, data sovereignty, uh, resilience, and security. So those are some of the considerations for uh, for cloud uh, cloud deployment. Uh, you know, when you when you start adopting for cloud. Moving on to the next slide. So this particular slide essentially goes walks you through a typical. Um, uh, scenario in the case, you know, the, the, the use case that is presented here is a uh, supply chain scenario where a Hyperledger Fabric blockchain is the implementation uh, platform. It, it talks about, you know, it looks into the movement of uh, uh, import export of the goods uh, from the port of origin and to the destination port. The transactions, the transaction process is initiated by the importer and then completed by the uh, imp uh, when the imported goods are cleared by the customs. So um, the what happens is 
a developer, you know, the first few things that could happen is the developer develops the application and deploys it, the administrator deploys it, um, the auditor, uh, the, I mean, the operator does the day-to-day -day operation. Um, from a business perspective, the first thing that could happen is the importer, the importer can request a letter of credit uh, from the bank. Um, and when the importer requests a letter of credit, the importer's bank can create a letter of credit on behalf of the importer through the bank's legacy system and publish it on the blockchain through the system integration component. Now, once the exporter's bank receives the letter of credit published, um, you know, that has already been published by the, by the importer, importing bank, they in turn can publish the receipt of on the blockchain and notifies the exporter. The exporter then readies the goods for shipment and requests the export control authority for clearance. The export control authority upon notification um, that the exporter is ready for shipping, the export control authority performs necessary uh, inspection of the goods and publishes the export certificate on the blockchain. And um, once that happens, the shipping company creates a bill of lading and publishes on the blockchain. Uh, the departing port confirms the shipment by publishing the shipment on the blockchain. The arrival port confirms the arrival of the shipment and publishes it on the blockchain. The customs authority inspects the goods and, and if it passes, publishes the customs clearance on the blockchain. And following the receipt of the goods, the importer can let the bank know of the receipt. And upon receipt of the goods, the importer from, uh, by the importer, um, the importing ba importer bank releases the payment to the exporting exporter's bank. And when the payment is received, the payment uh, by the exporting bank is handed over to the exporter. So it quickly goes over the scenario of um, a, a quick scenario of a typical transaction. Um, that can happen in a letter. I, I think I might have misspoken. It's this is a letter of credit uh, scenario. Okay. I think that's about it. Uh, back to you, Tracy. Great. Um, we have plenty of questions, so we should. Um, we'll just hop in there. Um, interesting, you know, folks. Too on on this next slide, um, we have a couple of other resources that may be useful. Um, a couple months back, uh, we hosted a webinar uh, with Hyperledger um, that you can access on our site. There's a direct link to that presentation. Uh, we also have the video recording. And some people are asking about today's presentation, where you can um, access a copy of the slides and view a recording. Um, right now in the Attachments and Links section on BrightTalk, uh, you can download the architecture. You can also download a copy of today's slides. Um, and we also post them to the Cloud Council website, which is cloud-council.org. We have an events page um, where you'll find this as well as some of the Hyperledger materials. Um, as you know, they, they just announced uh, version 1.0 of, of Fabric. Um, so jumping over to, to questions, first one here, uh, Sobod. Uh, would a digital user operate via a blockchain application or directly with the blockchain perform, uh, platform APIs? Would a digital users. Oh, okay, uh, what do you mean by digital? Uh, let me see if I can see the questions over here. Uh, Back when you were talking about the yeah. users. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah. Typically, you know, the expectation is typically the applications would front uh, the uh, the blockchain. Um, you know, how can I say? Like I mentioned earlier, applications will be the facade for the blockchain platform. I wouldn't see anybody directly uh, calling blockchain platform APIs because you know w when you start creating applications, the applications would have many more other things. Uh, and then, as part of their, um, uh, you know, user interface, they may have some activity triggering something, uh, which will then go and trigger to the to the blockchain API. So I wouldn't see a user directly operating on the blockchain API uh, platform API. They would usually go to the 
through the um, application. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, what special APIs or other libraries are required in general for an application to be blockchain enabled? Okay, so uh, it's it's not a question of special APIs. The platform, there are, I would say just the platform APIs. Platform APIs are what is used to access uh, and um, operate the uh, blockchain platform. So these are the typical APIs that you use. Now, as far as other, other libraries are concerned, um, that will depend, largely depend on your application, you know, what your application uh, does. And in fact, like, uh, there, there could be, um, in, in, there are a lot of samples that are available on GitHub. So they, they, these are the ones that are, for example, they're command line based application, I mean, sample applications. They use nothing but blockchain APIs. I mean, they, they don't it's just they use just pure platform APIs. But you know that may not be a viable application. When you when you create an application, you typically would have an interface. It's, it's very likely going to be in, interfacing with uh, with the enterprise systems. Um, so you would use whatever you know whatever typical uh, interfaces that you would have and the libraries that are required. Uh, to do to do those things. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> what potential does the blockchain bring to existing IoT scenarios? For example, uh, smart home. Do you think blockchain could be an intermediary between my Amazon Alexa platform and room temperature regulation platform? Or do you even say the name platforms are not needed anymore and perhaps replaced by the blockchain platform? Yeah, I, I'm not sure about um, controlling the temp you know, temp room temperature regulation, uh, but definitely there are situations where uh, you know, IoT plan uh, there are IoT scenarios. Uh, in fact, there's a YouTube video that's available uh, that uh, uh, you know that talks about. Um, it talks about a prototype that was developed and showcased in one of the conferences where you know a, a, a washing machine um, you know go da, you know is about to it, it kind of fails and then the washing machine reaches out to the manufacturers um, uh, to, to check if it's still under warranty and if it's under warranty you know it it it, 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 it claims the warranty and then requests for a service. So those are some of the scenarios where I can see an uh, IoT scenarios that I can I can think about. Now controlling the uh, room temperature, I, I, I honestly don't understand how that would be applicable. Um, but definitely there are many IoT related uh, uh, applications. In fact, like even in supply chain, you know, uh, as the supply as the, as as the goods move, um, they they could trigger by say you know. Uh, some of the, uh, as a, I mean, basically, the, as the goods move from one place to other, and as as it clears the shipment, for example, they could trigger some some uh, some events uh, that are maintained by the shipping company, and then that in turn could trigger some activity in the blockchain. Thank you, Sabor. Looks like this question came up twice, so I'm going to ask it now because it's a hot one perhaps. Um, <laughs> what are some of the considerations in favor of storing data on the ledger versus outside of the ledger? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, typically, you, uh, you know, the ledger, depending on how it's implemented, typically these ledgers are, are really, really uh, small data, data sets. Uh, you don't overwhelm the, the ledger data with a lot of things. So generally, you would store um, you would store the actual. Sometimes, you know, say for example, um, a document that is associated with uh, with the application. You you might store the document itself in your traditional document management. Oh, I think we lost Sabo. Oh, there we go. I think we lost you there for a second. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, you want me to repeat okay. that? If you don't mind, it was just a short no. little window. No, no, no problem. Um, so the question was, 
uh, you know, would you store what type of data you would store in Ledger and what outside? Um, Ledger, you typically store uh, data that is small, you know, real, relatively small size in nature. You don't put large amount of data in the ledger. Um, so, if uh, say, for example, in a uh, uh, in a supply chain or a letter of credit example that I was talking about, there could be a actual uh, physical copy of the um, bill of lading that somebody got, uh, the shipping company gave, and then they might have scan that and put that scan document uh, as part of the record. Now, these documents can be um, of lo a huge size, right? It could be multi, -meg multi megabytes in size. You typically store those type of things externally and put a reference uh, to that in the ledger. So uh, the point is, ledger, you, you want to store minimal information in the ledger that is only required. I mean, those things that are very relevant to the transaction, and you can always access, the, put a pointer there, and then uh, retrieve the rest of the information from external data sources. Okay, makes sense. Um, moving on, we could take a couple more questions. How about, how about this one? Is there an orchestration engine within the blockchain platform? How does one entity know that there is a transaction underway uh, and if it has or has not participated in the transaction that it was supposed to be a part of? Um, there isn't an orchestration engine itself because the blockchain, you know, what it primarily does is it receives trans transactions and it, it updates the ledger. Now, um, that does not mean you cannot orchestrate outside of the platform. You can definitely do that. And what are the key thing that kind of integrates, uh, a part of integration would be the events. So like I was mentioning earlier, um, events are published when certain, uh, certain uh, activities happen on the ledger. For example, if, if, if a new uh, transaction is added. So your application you know, can react to the event, events outside um, outside of the blockchain platform as part of the application, and you can leverage your existing orchestration too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, some distributed ledger technologies claim not to be based on blockchain. Uh, would this architecture apply to such systems? Uh, I'm. Um, I don't want to say, uh, without knowing the details, I don't want to say anything about that, but this one is, uh, uh, is specifically for, um, you know, if it, if it uh, largely replicates, uh, okay, let me put it this way. I, I think we, I need to know more uh, in detail about what the other things are before I can answer this. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, that's fine. I can pick another here, and, and I'll look for a little more commentary, and I could share it with you, too, afterwards. Um, if you could, Tabot, if you could discuss some of the differences uh, quickly between state and stateless smart contracts. Okay. Um, so let's see here. Uh, state and stateless. Uh, oh. So there could be, you know, it, it largely depends on the application that you're doing. Uh, so a, a stateless might be, you know, something came and then uh, a contract, I mean, a, um, for example, most of the Bitcoin transactions, you know, the transactions occur, they, they have, and then they, or actually in that case, there's no smart contract. But basically, when, when a smart contract executes, um, it needs some information, and it can go pick up that information, and then it never relies or uh, remembers that information. But there could be other situations where I have to think about other situations where uh, it might have to worry about other states. Uh, but then these states could be, in, 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 it's, it's all, it could be maintained 
elsewhere within the business application as part of the business execution. Thank you, Sabot. It looks like um, we're right at 12 o'clock here. Uh, thank you so yeah. much for the, the recap of the paper. Um, there's a couple questions we didn't get to, but I can help address those um, right after the presentation. Um, and later today we'll post um, a recording of, of the presentation onto the Cloud Council website. We'll send a note to everyone that signed up so you have uh, easy access to the links. Um, so thanks again for joining us. Thank you so much, Sabode. Uh, we hope to see you at a, a future presentation. Everyone have a good rest of the day. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.